Hi everyone. Hi uh, Trinadi. Very a very warm welcome to the session. The moderator for today. Um, I guess we can just uh, start uh, briefly introducing and you know the the initial um, introduction to the talk. Now, what do you suggest, uh, Trinadi? Yes, yes, uh, we can because um, I have quite a bit to say and I'm trying to find ways to kind of condense it. So I don't mind uh, beginning uh, so that yeah, we don't overshoot the time. So, all right, all right. So I'll just, uh, I guess I'll just briefly introduce the topic and the speaker and then, you know, you can um, start. So um, we have actually organized this talk, this guest lecture as a part of our English course. Uh, the English course that we teach uh, in Jindal Global Law School and Trinadi, uh, my co-instructor co co is also here, Josie. Um, so Hi. Josie, Trinadi, Trinadi, Josie. <laughs> he also co-teaches this course with me. And uh, thanks everyone for participating in the course. Um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, all of you are already aware of um, what Dr. Trinadi Nina Banerjee does, uh, what his scholarship is. But just to briefly introduce her, um, Dr. Trina Ninitna Banerjee is an assistant professor at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. Her book, which was also on our poster, um, new book forthcoming, Performing Silence Women in the Group Theater Movement in Bengal, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press India in 2021. Uh, we are all eagerly uh, waiting for that book. Uh, she has completed her MST in English at Oxford. For her PhD, she has worked on the history of women in group theater movements in Bengal in 20th century. She has also been involved in researching um, the interfaces between women's protests and political theater in contemporary Manipur for several years now. Between 2011 and 13, she taught at the Performance Theater and Performance Studies Department at JNU in the School of Arts and Aesthetics. Her research interests include gender, performance, political theater, theories of the body, post-colonial theater, and South Asian history. I personally have been taught by her, apart from uh, you know, um, being uh, introduced to her outside the class as well. I have been taught by her during my MPhil. And I have learned many things from her, perhaps, uh, you know, one of the most prominent things being the interconnection between politics and culture and how she actually made it possible to teach that in class. Outside the classes, outside her academic career, Dr. Banerjee has been a poet, a writer, journalist, uh, and also a theater and film actress too. She is a woman with many talents, and when it comes to her field of theater, she is a fascinating and incisive speaker. So we are all uh, waiting for the lecture. I'll just briefly sort of uh, introduce the topic for those of you who might not be aware. Um, so Antigone, we all uh, decided when you know it was a part of the course that we teach uh, English. I actually spoke to her long back that, you know, you must um, have a lecture with us uh, on Antigone. And which is why, you know, even though we are all sort of uh, struggling with the pandemic, we uh, are having the lecture as well um, in, in this situation. Uh, this semester, especially, I think, as I was teaching Antigone, it seemed like, you know, it's an absurd um, but a fitting exercise, actually, the dignity of death, right? The dignity of death, which is one of the central concerns uh, in Antigone. Um, it seemed to have been in our contemporary times, it seems to have been uh, completely lost uh, in, this, in this raging pandemic. Uh, the dignity of life that Antigone fought for, it was one of the central political demands. We see that it has been saved for only a chosen few. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of juncture of our contemporary situation where Antigone also comes alive. And it's not only that we can find reflections of Antigone, uh, Antigone's fight and Antigone's, you know, suffering within our only our recent times, but throughout history, Antigone as a text has been adapted 
has appealed to many. There have been many adaptations, and perhaps the most famous one is Antigone by Jean Anouil. Uh, this is a 1944 adaptation. The play was first produced and performed in Nazi occupied Paris. Ever since, this play has served as a crucial template for cultural activities which are anti authoritarian. Uh, which are concerning anti-authoritarian resistance as cultural activities, cultural political activities. I'm sure that you know you are, some of you are already familiar with the texts as well as the subsequent impact, both Sophocles and Jean Anuil. Uh, today, Dr. Banerjee is going to talk about Anuil, Sophocles, and other Antigones. And Trinadi, I guess that's about it. The floor is the floor. Sorry, the screen is all yours. And uh, thank you so very much for uh, you know joining us today. Um, uh, that introduction, thank you for embarrassing me thoroughly because you know one of the things about I need to change that bio. One of the things most significant about it is the has been, because I have, have been an actress. It's so long back I've forgotten. So I just feel like I sh I cringe every time it's talked about. But yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'll just uh, uh. request all the um, you know attendees to kindly switch off your mics um you know throughout the session we will have i'll just briefly explain she would uh, have a standalone lecture and then you know post the lecture you can also post your uh, questions if you have any in the chat box or you can you know raise your hands and unmute yourselves uh, you know one by one because following the lecture we are going to have a question and answer session so i'll just request when the lecture goes on everyone to just kindly switch off your mics Thanks. Yeah, so uh, Jigish and I sort of agreed that we I'll speak for an hour, after which we open this for questions, right? Jigish, should should I more or less? Yeah. Um, so all right, so so let me let me begin. And I think part of this came also from the fact that uh, when we were doing the MPhil course and Jigisha was there, I often used to go back to Antigone for various things and talk about uh, bits and pieces of of what uh, you know I uh, I feel about, uh, especially about Anil's text. Um, but uh, before I begin, just to say that this uh, this entirely comes from uh, you know my book, uh, chapter five of my book, especially which is uh, due out next month. And um, in fact, as I was preparing for this lecture, I became incredibly nervous because I realized that the, it's it's a really uh, you know eccentric book because it is it is meant to be about women in the Bengali group theater, but I spend a whole almost half of a chapter uh, discussing the, the nitty gritties of the political philosophy in Anvil and Sophocles. So I think I'm going to uh, be, you know, uh, getting some brickbats for that, but but be that as it may, I'm, I'm sort of uh, drawing largely from my book. Um, also, before I begin, I it means nothing much. It's just a lecture, but I want to, um, dedicate whatever I say to Natasha Narwal and uh, her father, uh, late comrade uh, Mahavi Narwal, because uh, it's nothing compared to the magnitude of her actions and the honor uh, of their actions. But uh, I think um, some of what I say, uh, some of what I've been thinking about will hold some relevance to what we see around us uh, today. So, uh, so to begin, um, so uh, my uh, concern with Antigone actually began when I was looking at the 1970s uh, in uh, Bengali theater. Um, and one of the most significant uh, productions of that time that, that sort of, you know, caught my attention and kept it uh, was uh, in fact a production by a theater group called uh, Nandikar. Uh, it was uh, performed, this particular play was performed um, between um, 1975 and 1977, which is uh, the exact years of the national emergency as you uh, know. And um, 
it was one of the few plays that was, uh, there were many others, of course, that were being staged at this point of time, in spite of uh, incredible uh, repression from the, the government. Uh, it was one of the few plays that was read while it was being performed and subsequently as well as one of uh, the sort of uh, major instances of resistance towards the, uh, the repression uh, and authoritarianism that the emergency had brought about uh, in, in the country. So, um, so what I'm going to do is that um, I'm going to try and present a sort of um, analysis of how female political agency is imagined in this performance and uh, how female political agency is imagined through theatrical representation during the period of the national emergency in Calcutta. I will also attempt to raise a few questions perhaps about the kind of politics that performance might do when politics itself has become impossible. And the efficacy of such a politics of performance in a state of complete suspension of democratic rights and resistance in the real politic. So what happens in a situation where authoritarianism, where, uh, you know, let us not mince words, fascism reaches a, a kind of a state of absolute control over human life, thought, and action, where it appears more and more that uh, resistance is, in fact, um, not simply uh, you know, difficult, but uh, impossible and sometimes futile. And in a sense, one could ask then in, a, in, a, in, a, in a state of such absolute uh, sort of uh, despair, of, of absolute loss of liberty, what good can performance do? And um, that is part of the question that I try to frame here. What, what good can performance do? What can be the politics of performance in a situation where in fact, uh, human liberty uh, per se is in question? So, um, so in what follows, I have not attempted to map either directorial intent or the exact political positioning of the theater group concerned, that is Nandikar. Uh, what kind of in resistance was intended in the directorial in in endeavor is not the driving question of this analysis. Rather, I try to somewhat eccentrically, uh, as I said, um, sort of focus on the statements of the leading actress of the production, Tia Chakraborty, who incidentally, um, uh, and tragically died in 1977, um, the beginning of 1977, just before the emergency was lifted and the next general elections were held. Uh, so she, she not, did not actually see the end of the emergency. Um, so I much of what I'm going to say hinges on the statements of the leading actress of the production, her interpretation of the political intent of the character she played, and some of the anecdotal memories of her performance from members of the audience writing after her death, which point towards a kind of complexity that may never have been explicitly stated or even entirely intended by the production as a whole. Um, so, so Nandika's production of Antigone was first staged in Bengali in Kolkata on the 25th of March, 1975. Kya Chakraborty played the re lead role while Ajitesh Bandabadha played the part of Creon, um, the king and Antigone's uncle. So it is hard to determine from what exists in uh, publication quite uh, sort of uh, specifically. I mean, there, there are Kya Chakraborty's interviews and some of in the sort of the essays, uh, you know, bits and pieces that she's left in her essays. And Rudra Prashad Sengupta's preface to the, the sort of the published version of the text, where uh, Sengupta basically says that the text draws both from, um, you know, uh, Sophocles and from Anvil. But Kea, on the other hand, makes a very specific statement that most of the te text was actually from Anvil and a very small portion uh, actually came from Sophocles. And so I've done a sort of very detailed uh, textual analysis over the years and I found that Kea's statement is in fact true. Most of the play was drawn from Anvil and not from, from the, the Greek, uh, uh, sort of um, the Greek tragedy. So, um, so Sengupta says in his preface that uh, he, he speaks about doing away with the intermission in the performance because, because that he felt was more in keeping with the ancient Greek performance tradition. But he does not elaborate on the guiding principles that determine the bringing together of the two dramatic versions of the Antigone myth. Um, so, 
the political nuances and impacts of these different sort of versions, and there have been many. So it's not just Anwil, but there were there was uh, you know there were there were uh, adaptations in Germany and in Africa and and in various parts of the world. Um, so these different adaptations differ quite starkly from each other, remolding the myth to different shapes and performance, and. This is a fact that is not quite considered in detail by Vaisen uh, by Gupta in his preface. Um, so on examining the text, of course, we found that, uh, I found that that it uh, sort of focuses on Anvil. And this is interesting because Anvil is writing in 1944 and the first performance of the play in France is uh, in 1944 when France is under German occupation and the Second World War is, you know, raging. Shomik um, Bandabadhai, uh, in an interview to me, uh, where I asked him clearly about what he feels about the difference between these, these two texts in terms of its politics, uh, their politics, said uh, there is a clear difference between the Sophocles text and the Anwil text of Antigone. Anwil's text works out a perfect balance between Antigone's position and Creon's to fit the situation in which he was staging it in Paris under German occupation. With the Nandikar version, which both uses as both Sophocles and Anvil, there was a shift towards the balancing between Antigone's impulsive rebel rebellion and the state's need to retain order. Kia Chakraborty, of course, leaves a statement that, that seems to contradict uh, this kind of a reading. So, so broadly speaking, uh, the, the general impression for scholars of Antigone is that um, in the Anvil text, Creon is given a kind of sympathetic place. He is he's given in terms just in terms of uh, textual and performance space a lot more leeway in order to make his point, uh, in order to establish the state's logic as opposed to Antigone's. Uh, in the original text, if we consider the Sophocles version, the original, we find that the dialogue between Creon and Antigone lasts a little more than you know uh, uh, three three pages, three three and a half pages. Um, where uh, their positions are sig sort of significantly clear. Um, Antigone represents, uh, you know, according to many scholars, the kinship laws that, that seem to predate the logic of the state, and Creon represents uh, the rule of law. And uh, neither of them are, are uh, willing to concede even an inch uh, to, to the other, and it, it seems to be a sort of a political deadlock, and, uh, and uh, sort of Antigone is, uh, is uh, sort of uh, executed or in a sense, ruled out of life. We'll also be discussing that, how she's in fact buried alive uh, and what might be the significance of that. So, but in contrast, in the Anvil play, we find that most of the play, in fact, is taken over by a prolonged dialogue between uh, Creon and Antigone, where they discuss uh, not simply the, the consequences, the personal consequences of Antigone's action, but also statecraft, uh, you know, what is the intention of, uh, you know, law, uh, the role of men and women in family and society, and and it seems like a sort of a, a sort of a, a sort of um, deeply um, kind of uh, analytical, emotional, affective, but also kind of very very detailed discussion on political philosophy. And that's interesting because it, it has often been argued really, really by a lot of critics that it was because Creon was given so much space that unlike many other plays which were disallowed within, you know, a, under German occupation in, in France, um, this play, in fact, was allowed because there was a sense, perhaps, within the authorities that 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 Creon uh, represented somewhere uh, the, 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 the logic of the state and represented it in a way that that made it sympathetic to, to the audience. And it is this kind of reading where sometimes, uh, you know, Anwil's text has also been a sort of uh, accused to be proto-fascist that I wanted to complicate. Because for me, on first reading and the first, second, third reading, again and again, the Anwil text appeared to be uh, definitely not fascist, but, but far more a far more complicated representation of the nature of modern state power um, than many other versions of the myth so um, so 
what is it that happens uh, in, 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 in the way that the modern state um, functions that makes it very different uh, and much more difficult for resistance to shape itself? This is not the kind of sovereignty that Sophocles' Creon uh, was representing. This is something else. There's something, something much more insidious about the forms of this kind of state power. And this is what we, we will try to kind of uh, look at. Let's look at first what Kea says, because Kea is pretty much the linchpin of, of uh, this discussion for me. Uh, for those who are familiar with Bengali, Bengali theater will know who Kea Chakraborty was, and she was one of the most uh, sort of spirited actresses and thinkers of the Bengali uh, sort of theater movement, uh, sort of um, that found itself broadly committed to a kind of left politics, and Kea remained one of the most sort of, um, sort of, uh, inspirational and, and, and exceptional voices within that, that field. Um, am I audible to voices? Voice, is my voice fading in and out? Uh, no, I guess it's fine. Um, I can hear so, you. Uh, I got a text from, should I speak a little louder? Is this better? Maybe I'm mumbling a bit because I got, I just got a text from someone saying that. Uh, this is better, but you yeah, yeah. are audible. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, so let's look at what, um, you know, Kia, uh, Kia herself says about Antigone. So she writes a short piece called Antigone Proshonge, uh, which means about Antigone where she says that the subject matter of the play Antigone, as far as I've understood, this is my translation, is protest. Antigone is a multi-layered play. The protest is similarly multi-layered. Our play is mainly an adaptation of Jean Anouilh's French play. Uh, there is only one section in the text that has been taken from Sophocles' ancient Greek play, and this, this I found to be true. Anouilh's play has a, and this is at the beginning of the play, but most of it just goes back to uh, Anouilh. Anouilh's play has a particular political context behind it. This is K.R. writing. During the Second World War, when France was under German occupation, there was no possibility of protesting against the victorious German mm. army. All plays that were performed were censored. It was in this sort of political situation that Anwil chose to write on a mythical subject, perhaps expressly in order to avoid censure from the alien regime. One of the principal characters of the play Antigone speaks in support of the states. One of the principal characters of the play Antigone, that is Creon, she doesn't name the other uh, character here, speaks in support of the state's domination, in support of dictatorship and authoritarianism. As a result, the German rulers saw in the figure of Creon a support of Hitler and his ideology, and that is why the play was cleared by the German censors for performance. But for the patriotic French, the play meant something completely different. Antigone, and this is the important part which we'll keep coming back to, Antigone says no many times to Creon, the representative of Hitler and his regime. In this clear, resounding no that Antigone throws at Creon, the French people found an echo of their silent protest against the alien dictatorship. And this is the political background of Jean Anouilh's play. Besides this, of course, there are many other kinds of protest in the play. This is being published after Kea's death. And we can assume that this was being written because she dies before the emergency ends, right in the middle of the emergency in Kolkata. Uh, you know, between 1975 uh, and 19, the early 1977. And uh, so somewhere, even though she doesn't quite spell it out clearly in this passage, uh, Kea is, is definitely also commenting on her political position as an actress uh, in a play um, under the complete sort of uh, statist repression uh, that artists, cultural workers, and citizens uh, were facing during the national emergency. Um, so so, so she, she finds a resonance uh, with Anwil's position. Um, so the next section is called Sophocles, Anwil, and the Face of the State. Kya Chakrabarty outlines a political context in which, which Anwil's 44 play was written very succinctly, but the fact remains that the interpretative legacy of Anwil's Antigone and readings of its political implications have always been characterized by controversy and conflict. While some have read it as proto-fascist, most of others have seen the play as a largely ambivalent text where Antigone as an infantile and somewhat irrational character stands outside the realm of politics, while Creon represents the political necessity of pragmatic state action. 
Creon can in some ways be easily read as a victim in Anwil's play, unlike in Sophocles, because in Sophocles, by the end of the play, Creon is very much a defeated man. The, cor the chorus berates him, Heman berates him, Tiresias berates him. So he, he, he and, and, and then of course, the suicide of his wife. So it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's clear that by the end of the play, Creon is a, is a, is a man proven to be wrong and is also broken, not just as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a head of state, but also as, as an individual. So that's in Sophocles. But here, um, Creon almost seems to be uh, like, like a victim. So, um, so he represents the political necessity of pragmatic state action, a cog in the wheel of a larger political machine that moves in ways far exceeding the understanding of individuals like Antigone. Read like this and performed in the period between 1975 and 1977 in Kolkata, the play could easily be seen as reactionary rather than radical, the latter being how Kea seems to unequivocally interpret it. Uh, but I wish to go a little deeper into this analysis. Kea goes on to say in the same article, Antigone, and this is in Anwil, all Kea's references are to Anwil, not to Sophocles. Antigone says at one point in the play, all my life, haven't I cursed the fact that I am a girl, that I have no right to this vast world outside, that I have no right to believe in any ideology? What could be stronger, and Kea writes, what could be a stronger protest against the diminution of the rights of women in a male-dominated society? Right? So Kea finds this particular piece of, uh, you know, dialogue resonant with her own uh, sort of passions. Um, so it is the denial of access to political life for women that Anwil's Antigone speaks about here. The actress Kia finds in this an expression of another layer of political protest, this time explicitly feminist. But what sort of access to political life is the female protagonist claiming in Anwil's play? Um, so one of the many things that Anwil te Anwil's text changes, like I said, is that it moves the entire textual concentration of the play towards a prolonged both political and ethical debate between Antigone and Creon. And this de debate appears in the Sophocles text as a fairly quick and stark argument between two incommensurable political forces, the authoritarian rule of the state and a woman who wishes to honor against the express orders of the state kinship ties that bind her to her dead brother. There, Creon is clearly a tyrant with no wish to allow a woman to disobey him, and Antigone the rebel who questions and defies his authority and is punished to it for, for it by death. And what that rebellion represents has been argued variously by Hegel, by, of course, by later by Butler, by, you know, various, various scholars. Uh, so, but what does Antigone say in Sophocles? She says, uh, now you have caught, will you do more than kill me? Creon says, no, nothing more. That is all I could wish. This seems to be a clear, hard voice of the state that is determined to follow its own rule of law. But contrast this to Anwil's Creon. This is what he says to Antigone when he, she has been caught bearing Polynices by the guards. Creon says, don't you realize that if anyone other than those three louts get to know what you've tried to do, I shall have to have you killed. If only you will keep quiet now and give up this foolishness, there's a chance I may be able to save you. But in five minutes time, it will be too late. Do you understand? This passage more or less remains the same in the Bangla translation in the public, published text. Uh, so this is the first and rather unavoidable difference between the two crayons. So Focles's crayon has no doubts that Antigone must die according to his own orders, and Anvil seems eager to do everything he can to avoid killing Antigone. Unlike Anwil's Creon, Sophocles' king is not a man, Sophocles' king is not a man divided against himself, not split between his authentic self and the political authority he represents and is bound to perform. Creon shows no separation from his own position as sovereign. He and his kingship are one. I'm talking about um, Sophocles. His conversation with Antigone is quick, matter of fact, and marked by expediency. The rebel and the sovereign have nothing much to say to each other. The argument that ensures seems to be over before long. The dialogue between them after, you know, is brief and cursory with expedient events taking over. Um, Creon says, we'll have no woman's law here while I live. 
right here, when he orders the guards to take his many and Antigone outside, he says, take them and keep them within the proper place for women. He's, he's clear. With this, Creon lays out clearly the nature of Antigone's transgression. As a woman, it is not her place to participate in, let alone disrupt political life. Ismene tells her, her sister, oh, think Antigone, we are women. It is not for us to fight against men. Our rules are stronger our rulers are stronger than we, and we must obey in this or worse than this. May the dead forgive me, I can do no other, but as I am commanded to do more is madness. So this reference to madness is something that keeps back, keeps coming back again and again, both in Sophocles and in Anvil. So I, I, I am going to try and sort of pinpoint how madness, prostitution, and animality, bestiality, becoming animal are constant imageries of horror and repulsion that are associated with the figure of Antigone, not just in Sophocles, but also in Anvil, uh, consistently by her antagonists, by her associates, by even people who love her. Uh, so by the end of the play in Sophocles, the confidence in Creon's voice has begun to falter. He is questioned in his actions, you know, by various people have talked about this and you know the text, so I'm not going to go over this again. Uh, so, you know, Tiresias, for example, is wielding a double-edged sword. He is saying that Creon's thoughtless actions are not only a crime against eternal law that will bring ruin to his family, but is also strategically and politically misguided, right? So, and we also realize from the chorus's uh, statements after Antigone's death that she will be remembered, if not consecrated, as a rebel for a just cause against a foolish and headstrong autocrat who repents his own arbitrary pride. So there's a se sense of a kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, moral conclusion in which Antigone has a certain kind of a, a sort of a, a moral victory, if not a sort of a victory in the, in the, in the real world. So, but in Anvil, suddenly we find that the political and ethical rationale between, behind Antigone's act is no longer left so clear. Uh, so in a sense, uh, so I'll tell you what, what Anvil actually does. So um, uh, I'll just come to it in a little bit. Uh, so, and we see that often even in Sophocles, the argument has been that, that you know, Antigone does not represent uh, any kind of uh, political voice. She represents a certain kind of allegiance to a pre-political, uh, you know, notion of man. And um, so even though she has often uh, assumed a certain kind of radical representative function for feminist politics, many have argued that that, that she somehow is, is, is a kind of, a, you know, a, a sort of a pre-political opposition to, to politics itself. And, and Butler discusses this in detail in her text. And I understand that you've engaged with Butler's text. Um, so, Butler herself, however, argues with this evaluation of Antigone's significance merely as a force representative of pre-political kinship ties by pointing out how complicated Antigone's own position with the normative blood relationships is, given that she's both sister and daughter to King uh, Oedipus. So, and she, she, in doing so, Butler highlights Antigone's liminality, liminality in relation to the polis. Um, so, but this is interesting here. What, what Butler is saying about the Sophoclean Ant Antigone is that she is outside the terms of the polis, but she is, as it were, an outside without which the polis could not be. The ironies are in the, no doubt more profound than Hegel understood. She speaks and she speaks in public precisely when she ought to be sequestered in the private domain. What sort of political speech is that which transgresses the very boundaries of the political, which sets into scandalous motion the boundary by which a speech ought to be contained? And this is interesting because this is this resonates for me at least, even though I, you know I, I did not engage with it in this particular uh, you know uh, paper, um, uh, with uh, Roncia's idea of politics, for example. So when Roncia speaks about dissensus, he in fact uh, will uh, say at one point that politics is not about a conflict of interest, which is often how it is understood in liberal terms, but it is a, a conflict about what constitutes interest? What is political? What is a political question? Uh, a fundamental tussle on what constitutes the political, uh, you know, uh, is in fact 
the sort of the very essence of politics. So um, not a conflict of interest, but a, a conflict on what constitutes interest. And um, Rancia also says the only truly political question in any, and this is not an exact quote, the only truly political question in any situation is the question that in fact cannot be asked. So that which remains outside the particular partition of the sensible that cannot be articulated as political within a particular uh, sort of uh, you know distribution of uh, the sensible right or certain certain understanding of political rationality what remains unintelligible um so um right um so but in Anvil's text, uh, we find that there is, there is, of course, the fact that Antigone deeply disturbs the gendered conventions of political practice, but his Anvil does so in ways that radically questions the conventional rationale that forms the very basis of the rule of law, which punishes both her and colonizes. Her act seems to be an attempt to destabilize the existence of pragmatic statist wisdom per se. It seems that Anwil's Antigone is at first glance more deserving of the accusation of being outside politics than of Sophocles, since it appears that it is not a, sim a simple violation of a particular divine law that she is contesting, but the whole edifice of the state's reason as such. So, so what happens, let me just summarize this because I won't have uh, the time to go through all of this together. So what, what uh, Anvil does in, in his text is that he makes Creon apparently committed, uh, appear committed to saving Antigone's life. And there seem to be multiple mo motives why he's interested in, 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 sort, of, um, in, in sort of not allowing her to die. Uh, one, of course, is that he seems clearly fond of Antigone, which is something that is unimaginable in the, in the Sophocles text. The other is that he appears to be also wishing for a life of happiness for Hemon, to whom Antigone is engaged. But he also seems to be committed to a certain kind of uh, pragmatism. And he realizes that Antigone's death is capable of destabilizing the, the, the sort of the, the political equilibrium that he is aiming at. Um, and in doing so, he does in sort of being committed to sort of apparently saving Antigone, you know, sort of preventing her death according to the rule of law. Um, so in a sense, he's almost militating against himself. He's saying that it is my decree and therefore the rule of law that you must be killed if you continue to defy my orders. But on the other hand, um, I want to do everything I can to prevent you from, from, from dying. So, so what he does in order to convince Antigone is that he tries to again and again press home to her the fact that her action will not have uh, you know, a political uh, sort of effect on on the city. One of the things, one of the first things that he tells her is that, you know, he establishes for her the, the reality of the political world that, that she seems to be unfamiliar with. He tells her that both Polynices and Ethiopolis, the two brothers, one of whom the state has declared a hero and the other whom, whose death has been declared unmournable, who has been left outside the city walls to sort of, um, you know, to be sort of eaten by vultures. He says that both of them, uh, you know, were found in a state outside the city walls when, in, you know, when they were found dead in battle, that they were unrecognizable. So, and he claims that both, in fact, had a sort of uh, a history of uh, sort of political unscrupulousness. And he's trying to prove to Antigone that, that she does not in fact know which of the brothers she's bearing because both the bodies were so mangled when they were found in battle that they, they, one could not distinguish one from the other. But he says that he was forced, he had to, in, in the interest of the stability of the state, declare one to be a hero and the other to be the, the rebel. And this is the kind of logic of the state that he wants Antigone to grasp. Um, and, and accept. Um, what happens with Antigone here is that she, in a sense, is, is 
she also, in fact, recognizes the fact, and she, she agrees with Creon, that the, the ritual of burial itself is not something that she owes to religion. You know, She sees this particular action of burial as something that has a certain kind of value in itself outside questions of political efficacy. And this is what I try to trace uh, as, as uh, sort of, as uh, the distinctiveness of Antigone's action in Anvil. So, um, so love, to a lot of critics, and uh, Antigone has appeared to be infantile and unreasonable, especially in the Anvil text. Um, and it appears that in, in, uh, in Anvil, as opposed to Sophocles, it is Antigone and not Creon who refuses to listen to reason. Um, but the trouble is that the primary distinctive feature of Creon in, in this, uh, in this uh, text is that unlike the Sophoclean Creon, he, is, he considers himself to be a manager. And he says this, he says this in, in so many words. He says that I am no great king as your father claimed to be, as Oedipus claimed to be. I simply consider myself to be a manager of this state. I am a manager of the life and goods of the people who, who make up this state. So um, just give me a minute, I'll come to that a place. So, um, so, so to just go back to the kind of imagery so that that kind of gathers around Antigone as she as she sort of commits her act of transgression, we see again and again that Antigone's political transgression against the state also pushes her to the margins of other kinds of socially acceptable behavior. For example, the norms of chastity that govern, uh, you know, uh, women's lives, human sanity, for example, images of whore, mad woman, infant, and animal seem to hover continually around her figure in the speeches of others about her and those that are directed at her. So the nurse, for example, calls us for a whore because she imagines a brazen hussy because she imagines that he has gone. She's gone out in the night to uh, to sort of meet her lover, um, and and this these kind of accusations of madness, of, of, of sexual depravity and animality are constantly thrown at her. So um, in a sense, it appears as if knowing, it, it appears as if that acting politically would mean losing the right to be ever fulfilled as a woman or ever qualify to be a woman enough. And it appears to Antigone also that she's making an inevitable choice between her life as a woman and her life and death as a political transgressor. So several associations of prostitution and insanity appear in the guard's speech as they attempt so the guards who find Antigone when she's burying uh, Polynices, um, uh, sort of again and again refer to her as mad or as an animal. So several associations of prostitution and insanity appear in the guard's speech as they attempt to characterize Antigone's transgressive behavior. The limits that separate political and sexual transgression and insanity seem to have blurred in this space as the guards, ordinary citizens, try to make sense of Antigone's mad action. Uh, so one of the guards says, Oedipus's daughter, eh? The tarts, the whores we pick up on the on the street always tell us to watch out because the police chief's girlfriends. Antigone says, I don't care about dying, but I won't have them touch me. Oh, but you're not afraid of touching earth or corpses. You talk about dirty hands, what about your own? Antigone looks at her hands in their handcuffs and smiles. They're covered with earth. They took away your spade, so the second time you did it with your bare hands. I turn my back for a bit to get a chew of tobacco and there she is clawing up the earth with her nails like a blooming hyena and in broad daylight. And the fight she puts up when I try to arrest her, tries to scratch my eyes out, shouts and bawls about having to, about having to finish the job. Um, and the other guard says, I arrested one just as mad the other day, showing everyone her backside. So. When the guards reach, and this is a conversation that happens with Antigone, you have the mad woman, you have the whore, and you have the hyena, you know, because she's clawing at the earth with her bare hands. And when the guards reach Creon, they tell her that at first they saw a storm of dust and they thought it was a dog or a wolf uh, digging at the earth. And, and it's only later when the dust settled that they realized that it was actually a woman. And 
these are images that again and again return to Antigone's, uh, you know, um, sort of to the figure of Antigone, how she's imagined, how she's visualized, how we are uh, sort of, uh, how, how others see her. She, she's seen as somehow bestial. And I try to understand why it is, what happens to Antigone that she begins to be less than human. So it's clear that she makes a transgression that supersedes her position as a woman in this polity. In Sophocles and in Anwil, again and again, we find that Antigone transgresses not simply by disobeying the state's order, but she, she transgresses by simply acting politically. So the one level of transgression is her disobeying of the, of the order of the state. The second level of her transgression is her transgression as a woman because she chooses to act politically when she's not meant to be a political being. So that fundamental level of transgression is what Kea was trying to get at in that initial statement that we, we read. I am disallowed from acting politically, whatever that action may be. So female transgression is defined by her stepping into public space illegitimately as mad woman or whore. And these are the first suspicions that are thrown in Antigone's direction by strangers and family alike. The guards think her mad, the nurse thinks her loose. The animal imagery that is often used to describe Antigone is a legacy of the Sophoclean text. There in the Sophoclean text, the sentry tells Creon there was a girl screaming like an angry bird when it finds its nest left empty and the little one's gone. Um, when she conf confesses to her guilt, Creon tells the chorus, a little halter is enough to break the wildest horse. She's, a, she's an animal, an animal gone mad, and, which, which must be restrained. And this carries on from Sophocles. In An Anwil, for example, uh, Antigone is a tiger. She's a hyena. Uh, instead of an angry bird or a wild horse. And this is not the last of the animal imagery that the text surrounds her with. Jonas tells Creon, just like a little animal. In fact, with the air so hazy, that's what one of my mates took her for at first. It's some animal, he says. But I say, no, it's not. It's too neat for an animal. It's a girl. All right. So suspected of sexual transgression, Antigone is on the margins of polite society. Suspected as mad, she's on the margins of human sanity, but in being continu continually compared to animals, wild animal, tiger, hare, hyena, she's a creature, a monster at the edge of the human itself. The action of burial never appears as completely human in the text. So whenever you see it, whenever you see it imagined, you, you imagine it almost as an animal's action, not as a human action. Whenever it comes to light, it seems to, be, it seems to be accompanied by the inability of ordinary citizens to describe it in human terms. You, of course, don't see it on stage, much like the norms of you know, Greek, uh, a Greek play. We, we, this continues in Anvil. We, we don't see Antigone actually doing this, but it is described. And because it is described and narrated constantly, these, these images of bestiality surround it. So uh, now to come to the point of what, what is it that Antig makes Antigone like an animal? So I go to, uh, you know, uh, Giorgio Gambin as he begins his book, Homo Sacer, uh, Sovereign Power and uh, Bare Life, where Agamben writes that the Greeks had no single term to express what we mean by the word life. They used two terms, zoe, which expressed the simple fact of living common to all human, all living beings, animals, men, or gods, and bios, which indicated the form or way of life proper, proper to an individual or group. In stepping out of the way of life proper to a woman, where she's allowed no legitimate access to political action, with her waywardness in the public sphere, Antigone steps into a liminal space where the distinctions between her and other living beings who are not social and or completely lack the capacity for rationality are blurred. So this action of stepping out, so she, she by stepping out of the domestic sphere, she takes on a space that is disallowed to her. She, she actually makes a transgression, makes a claim that is illegitimate. And in doing so, she not just loses her space in the polity, but also somehow destabilizes her role as a human. Uh, that this action of stepping out or crossing over is 
is much bigger in the case of Anil's Antigone, because in contrast to the Sophoclean Antigone, she holds up no law in opposition to that of the state. She is not speaking, in, Anwil's Antigone is not speaking in favor of kinship. She's not speaking in favor of, uh, you know, religion. She in fact agrees that the ritual of burial so far as religion is concerned is mambo jumbo, right? In spite of this, she in fact, sees her action as valuable in itself, in spite of its, uh, you know, non-efficacy in the political sphere, in spite of the fact that he does not consider its religious value. She considers this action to be politically valuable in itself, in spite of its lack of efficacy, lack of religious value. And that, in a sense, makes, to me, um, two, two, two things happen. One is that Creon's nature of statecraft is the nature of modern governmentality. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that briefly. And which attempts to manage life, to maximize happiness, to speak of citizenship as, uh, as, as, as an access to happiness, to the good life. He wants to save Antigone. On the face of it, he wants to, in fact, uh, maximize the life and happiness of his, um, of his citizens. And if you remember Foucault, you'll remember that, that he says that we go from executions to deaths in wars where wars are fought on the logic that citizens, the masses must be saved. So people are killed on the logic of saving lives. So, so this management of life, this, this kind of management of the, of the, of, of, uh, you know, the life and goods that, that sort of make up a polity uh, sort of defines a state of power uh, and the rhetoric of state power, of modern state power, right? Uh, so so, so uh, and Antigone's resistance stands against it also in very modern terms in saying that I do not appeal to a, a pre-political religious law nor to a law of kinship, but to the the political and ethical value of an action of resistance, of saying no as valuable, non-instrumental, without the need to calculate political efficacy, right? So these two things stand in opposition to each other, which is, in my view, a far more modern opposition between the managerial logic of uh, governmental power and a resistance that wants to sort of um, define itself ethically um, uh, and, and sees that sees political action as having value in spite of the, the absence of efficacy what should I achieve by bearing polynices nothing because the repression because the because in fact the double speak of the managerial state its ability to lie and convince people of its uh, you know uh, fictions is so great that Antigone's action uh, will not even have the kind of recognition that she gets from the chorus or from Tiresias and Sophocles. The people are most likely not going to recognize, uh, you know, Antigone as a hero, but would rather see her as a traitor, as seditious, as treasonous, you know, as against the nation of, uh, you know, Thebes. Uh, but even so. Antigone says, my action is valuable. In spite of all of these reasons, what I do, what I am doing is valuable. And we'll try to understand how this works. So I, I have 20 minutes more, so I'll try to sort of speed up a little bit. So, um, so this action of stepping out or crossing over is much bigger in the case of Anwil's Antigone, because in contrast to Sophoclean, the Sophoclean Antigone, she holds up no law in opposition to that of the state. No divine legitimacy supports her action. There is no religion. There are no gods. Neither does the text validate it by establishing Creon's complete defeat at the end. She presents, Antigone presents her own action as valuable in itself and asserts that it is worthwhile by its own logic. Uh, so if you go back to the Greek understanding of, of you know, uh, man as a rational animal, we have uh, the notion that there are, you know, uh, there is 
of course, the animality of man. But in addition to that, there are some specific traits such as rationality and capacity for political existence. In daring to claim for herself a political existence, Anuil's Antigone steps out of Oikia, the space for feminine silence and toil, into the space of the police, the space of male political action and verbal participation in the affairs of the city state. But in doing so, she lays claim to an illegitimacy that, that, that she lets go of the even the imperfect rationality that is allowed to women within this, this world. So women are meant to have a certain kind of imperfect rationality. They're meant, even in Aristotle, to be social animals capable of congregation. Aristotle compares them to bees, uh, but not for political thought and action. But in having made this transgression, this even this imperfect rationality is taken away from Antigone. So she's imagined as mad, as a child at best, um, as a whore, and at worst, an animal, non-human, in fact. So in this, she becomes somewhat subhuman, also especially because her action appears to be inefficacious and unintelligible within the logic of the state. So, so in overreaching herself and claiming a political act, Antigone loses even this imperfect ir rationality allowed to women, a quality that makes them part of human sociality. She becomes an irrational and asocial animal. It seems almost as if she's moved back in the eyes of others on a chronological and evolutionary grid to a pre-human, pre-political phase. Therefore, the same action that makes her a political agent in her own perception disenfranchises her as a human being with a proper hold on the world. To others, Antigone's action displays a lack of rationality because as a woman, she's not judged as capable of political existence in a sense. She goes against not just the basic laws of the police, but the common sense about life and gender that governs them. The judgment of irrationality does not depend on what the actual content of her action is. She transgresses simply by acting. So um, let me come to the point about uh, government. So we see how, uh, you know, um, one second. Uh, Jigisha, can you tell me how much time I have? Um, yeah, you have, it's 10.42, so you have till 11. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this is this is the point about Antigone's transgression in Anvil that we find that that she loses her grip on the human itself. But to look at Crayon, we find that what he says about his own kingship is interesting. Um, in dissuading Antigone, Crayon acts here not simply out of a spirit of kindness, but which sets him apart from a more brutish and tyrannical uh, crayon in Sophocles' text, but from a sense of political expediency and a consideration of the pragmatic good of the state. He seems interested in perpetuating and managing life, maximizing stability and political happiness, while minimizing instability and unnecessary pain. His primary objection to Antigone's action is that it is pointless. Uh, he says, and it, this is what he says to Antigone, my name's only Creon, thank God. I've got both feet on the ground and both hands in my pockets. I'm not so ambitious as your father was and all, I'm, all I am at now uh, is that I'm king and I try to see that the world is a bit more sensibly run. There's nothing very, very heroic about it. It's just an everyday job. And like the rest of them, not always very amusing. But since that's what I'm here for, that's what I'm going to do. And if some scruffy messenger comes down from the mountains tomorrow and tell, tells me that he's not too sure about my parentage or reference to Oedipus, I'll send him packing. So Creon's mode here seems to be the anti-tragic mode, and the logic of his argument is clear. He has plans for Antigone's life, not her death. So he, in a sense, is... is is speaking of a different mode of governance. Uh, it is for the efficacious management of life and the good of the state that Creon wishes to avoid Antigone's death penalty. His managerial logic also matches, uh, in many senses, the political discourse of authoritarianism, where the state system appears valuable above everything else. But what cons consists in the good of the state? It is here interesting to look at Foucault's arguments uh, on the common good and on governmentality. So 
The good is the obedience to the law, hence the good for sovereignty is that people should obey it. So that's, that's the definition of sovereignty, just obedience. In contrast, Foucault says, with governmentality, it's a question not so much of imposing law on men, but of disposing things. That is, of employing tactics rather than laws, and even of using laws themselves as tactics to arrange things in such a way that through a certain number of means, such and such ends may be achieved. So there is an element of instrumental and managerial logic at every element, at every level of statecraft. The finality of government resides in the things it manages and in the pursuit of the perfection and intensification of the processes it directs. And the instruments of government, instead of being laws, now become a range of multi-form tactics. So um, if we read Anwil's play through Foucault's 1978 essay, it appears that unlike the sovereign Oedipus, Creon, who calls himself a trader in politics and whom Antigone calls a cook in the kitchen of politics, who works in the dirty kitchen of politics, stands at the crossroads of, the so of sovereignty and the modern art of governance, and he represents the latter. The Im image that Creon uses to describe his work as a is of a ruler, as the ruler of an unruly state, is the image of a ship. He says, Try to understand for a minute, and this is what he says to Antigone, try to understand for a minute, you little fool. I've tried hard enough to understand you. Someone has to say yes. Someone has to steer the ship. It's letting water in on all sides. It is full of crime and stupidity and suffering. The rudders are adrift. The crew want to obey the, obey the orders. All they're interested in is looting the cargo. The officers are busy building a comfortable raft for themselves and cornering all the fresh water. The masts split, the winds howling, the sails will soon be in shreds, and the whole lot of them will die together because they think of nothing but their own petty concerns. So the only things that have a name now are the ship and the storm. So the ship, a sail in a ocean that is awash with a storm. That is the image of the state. Now, if you think of Foucault's essay, governmentality, this is the exact image that Foucault points out is the recurring metaphor that is invoked in the newly emerging treatises on the art of governance that write against Machiavelli's prints. If you, if you go back to the essay, you'll find exactly this image of the ship. The imprecation of men and things, I believe, readily confirmed by the metaphor that is in, inevitably invoked in all these treatises on government, namely that of the ship. What does it, and this is from Foucault, what does it mean to govern a ship? It means to clearly take charge of the sailors, but also of the boat and cargo. To take care of the ship also means to reckon with the winds, the rocks, and the storms, and it consists in that activity of establishing a relation between the sailors who are to be taken care of and the ship, and so on. So basically, this mode of governance, this modern mode of governance, constantly sort of puts forward in in as a logic for all its violence, all its repression, all its uh, sort of injustice, this notion that the ship is at sea and the sea, a storm is raging on that sea. So therefore all acts of repression, all acts of violence, all acts of, of uh, disenfranchisement, of, of uh, people losing homes, uh, of, of it is, is justified for this notion of a greater good where in fact, everything is a means to an end where a certain logic of, of management, of the best possible management, defines this, this, this sort of this rhetoric. And standing against it, Antigone's resistance also reformulates itself in, in very different terms than what we find in, in Sophocles. So, uh, so therefore, I think, in many ways, when Kea speaks of Anvil's text as resonant to her own time, she is quite correctly identifying that in Anvil, uh, the, the, the head of the state is, 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 is representative of a kind of far more insidious uh, rhetoric that, that attempts to first tempt you through this logic of of happiness, of, of uh, a, a pleasant and sensible life that must be sort of uh, absolutely refuted at the core 
by this resounding no in order for resistance to take shape. So this instrumental logic of politics is what Antigone seems to stand against, not for religion, not for kinship, but against per se, in a sense, the logic of this managerial state that constantly feeds its citizens this rhetoric of the maximization of happiness and the good life of common sense and everything sacrificed to this, this kind of you know, almost fictitious manufacturing of, uh, of this sort of aspiration towards happiness and the good life. So, so there is a... Um, there is a way. There's a there's a part in the play where Antigone is actually sort of uh, sort of speaking to Ismene about how this kind of practice of docility has been imposed on her since the time that she was a child. And in a sense, this once again reminds you of Foucault and the notion that the, the, this docility of the body is something that 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 is cultivated uh, from the very beginning. That the socialization of a child, in fact, includes this sort of this this practice of docility. So. Um, I was supposed to understand that you mustn't eat your cake before you finished your bread or butter. I give you give all your pocket money to a beggar or run in the wind till you drop or drink when you're hot or go swimming just when you feel like it. Understand, understand, always understand. It seems as if she is, this is like an unruly rant of the child and Antigone seems to be often read in unreal like that. But, but in a sense, for me, to me, it seemed that Anwil, uh, Antigone is taking the question of discipline to its earliest manifestations. The disciplining of, and punishment of a child's body, for example, as, as, as a preparation for life. Um, so how does she refute Creon? Um, she, in fact, sort of, uh, in a speech that sort of, uh, sort of negates all of Creon's logic towards where he's trying to tell her that, you know, Antigone, marry Creon, a happy life is awaiting you, uh, sort of accept that happiness, what good will this action do? Uh, so uh, at one point she says, I spit on your happiness. I spit on all of you who seem to be sort of, sort of hankering after happiness, like, you know, uh, little children. I, I, I want a different kind of life and different kind of death. And at one point, um, in order to convince, uh, in fact, uh, scare um, uh, Antigone, Creon begins to uh, twist her arm. Um, and here, uh, this is something very interesting happens here. Um, Antigone says, all you can do is have me put to death. And Creon says, what if I have you tortured? Antigone says, what for? To make me cry and beg for mercy? To make me swear to anything? And then do the same thing all over again when the pain stops? Interestingly, she doesn't deny that, that the torture will hurt her, that she will cry and beg. But she also says that when the pain stops, I will go back and again do the same thing. I will go back every time and bury Polynices as long as I'm alive. Um, and Creon keeps twisting her arm. Antigone says, let go, you're hurting my arm. Creon with a twinkle in her eye, perhaps that's the answer. Perhaps I ought to just twist your wrist and pull your hair as boys do when they play with little girls. He looks at her, serious again, close. I may be your uncle, but we are rather severe on each other in our family. So it doesn't strike you as strange. I, a king set at naught by you, yet listening patiently. I'm taking all this trouble to keep you from dying. And he keeps twisting her arm as he said this. And that's actually the cover image from my book, that, that particular scene uh, from, from Nandika's Antigone, where Creon is twisting Antigone's arm. And at one point, suddenly, Antigone begins to smile. And she says, you're twisting too hard now. It doesn't even hurt. I cannot feel my arm. So here, I really don't have time to kind of go through the details of the 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 the, the essay anymore, but just to summarize what I try to argue here. So here is Creon with his logic of maximizing happiness. And Antigone has already transgressed on several levels. She's disobeyed his decree. She's also transgressed as we understood by, by simply acting politically as a, as a woman. But at this point, when Creon begins to give her a demonstration of what torture would look like and feel like, The scene proceeds from a point where Antigone 
sort of expresses pain, the fact that she's feeling pain, pain. She's, she, she's, 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 she cries out in agony. She says, oh, it's hurting my, 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 I cannot, you know, it, it, don't, don't hurt me. Um, and Creon keeps doing it. She, she keeps, keeps sort of hurting her. So in Creon's uh, sort of logic of how he understands life and, and men and women, gender, the state, uh, his, his entire intent is the most sensible management of what he considers to be the common good. And to this end, all sorts of violence, repression, and uh, you know, um, injustice can be mobilized. And in his, in his understanding, in his sensibility, he justifies all of this through the notion that happiness for the greatest number must always be maximized. And, and his logic also understand that pain is something that you instinctively avoid. Uh, there, is, there, is, there is no, uh, no sense in Antigone's sort of rejection of um, personal happiness for a political action which will have no effects whatsoever. He presses upon Antigone the fact that if this conversation were to go outside the palace walls. If anybody other than the guards were to find out about it, then the general population of the city would actually consider her a traitor and might in fact lynch her to death, even if Creon did not in fact execute her. So, so in a sense, the kind of moral resolution that the Sophocle and Antigone has, Antigone and Anuil does not have. There is, there is every, uh, sort of um, indication that the populace of the city is equally convinced by Creon's lies and will in fact see Antigone as treasonous uh, and her action as, as not just meaningless, but in fact uh, something that is anti-state uh, and, and therefore treacherous, therefore, therefore uh, politically sort of um, reprehensible. So she, she does not have uh, the assurance of a religious, uh, you know, uh, pre-political structure that justifies her action. She does not have, uh, she says, uh, a faith in the kind of laws of kinship that can stand against the laws of the state. She does not even know that Polypolynices and Ethiocles uh, were, were, were distinct in, in their political actions. Creon tries to press upon her the fact that both of them might have actually had a severe sort of uh, political flaws. Uh, she does not in fact even know which brother she's be bearing because the two bodies were mangled. In spite of all this, Antigone claims that she will go on. Every time Creon stops torturing her, stops threatening, threatening her, she will go back to this no man's land outside the city to bury her brother one more time. And she sees this action of again and again refusing the rule of law this, uh, you know, decree that disallows her from mourning uh, a man who died in war. Her brother, is that important? Perhaps yes. But a human being who died uh, in war, the decree disallows her from giving this man an honorable burial, from honoring his death. So this death has been declared as unmournable. In many ways, if you think of the emergency in Calcutta and what was going on from after the Naxalite movement in uh, Naxalbari movement in uh, Bengal and in Kolkata, again and again, newspapers and the police reports would, would speak about uh, anonymous corpses on the streets of the city, floating on the Ganga, unclaimed corp corpses, unwitnessed deaths. So this lack of witnessing of deaths of deaths becoming unnumbered, unwitnessed, and on top of that, declared by the state as unmournable because they are deaths of transgressors. This was a political fact of the Calcutta that Kya Chakrabarti lived and performed in. So, so, so it is not simply that these deaths were anonymous, that these corpses were, were unidentified, but the fact that witnessing was in fact disallowed by the state, not just mourning, but witnessing the death 
was disallowed. So even if you did witness it, there had to be a certain kind of asepticide or what Diana Taylor calls a death of perception, right? Uh, so, so that is what quotidian, the quotidian violence of the state had done. So, and all of this, you remember at this point of time, Indira Gandhi's 20 point program, the idea that the state was in fact, sort of uh, propagating a socialist program, all of this maximizing the happiness of the most, uh, you know, numbers of ordinary citizens, this, that you're doing this, that the, the state was in fact managing the well being of its citizens. So if four lakh were left out, if 19 lakh were left out, whoever was being left out, they were being left out because of the good of the maximum number. This notion was something that was deeply embedded in that rhetoric. That the 20 point program at the times of the most numbers of journalists, activists, ordinary citizens were imprisoned under the MISA. The 20 point program was, was in, in sort of in an enlarged in huge sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, visual uh, sort of uh, posters and hoardings across cities, right? So the notion the that in a sense, it was the maximization of the happiness of the citizens that for which all of this, in fact, became necessary. And all of this was, it did not even need to be argued that all of this was necessary because the media was silent because all the newspapers had been completely shut up. And that these deaths were in fact, not simply sort of uh, forbidden, uh, to be mourned, but they were also forbidden to be witnessed. This lack of witness is what I'm trying to. So in that it's it is in fact out in a sense a space metaphorically outside city walls. In that there were no citizens, even if there were people, to witness what was going on. Even you you had the the sort of the 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 sort of the the law in fact imposed a certain kind of um, invisibility. On, on, on these debts. So in a sense, when Antigone rebels against Creon's dictum, she is sort of, as, as Kea says, uttering a resounding no against the logic, the rule of law that, that, that can sort of make this um, logically justifiable within a certain kind of governmental logic. And, for for uh, Antigone, in fact, uh, in Anvil, you see that her action, Creon is quite clearly able to prove that her action will have absolutely no efficacy. But what Antigone is able to do in this uh, in this context is to is to somehow uh, claim for herself the value of political action, in spite of its inefficacy. And in this particular scene, which I think is crucial to the, the performance and to the text of the play and the, the, the political philosophy that it some, seems to get at, is that at the end of uh, the scene, Antigone says, Creon, you can keep twisting my arm now, it does not hurt anymore. And she begins to smile. And Creon is so afraid that she lets, he lets go of her arm and he steps back. And Antigone recognizes this fear. What is Creon afraid of? This is an unarmed girl. And Antigone, and Antigone says to her that you are not amused, you're afraid. You're afraid of the fact that, that I am able to in fact recognize the fact that I am being tortured, that I am in pain. But in spite of this, I can reach a point where I say that it does not hurt anymore because the pain has gone on too long. And every time you stop, I will return. So in a sense, what Antigone does is that she completely destabilizes Creon's logic of torture, uh -huh. which, which, is, which is also sort of uh, embedded in his logic that citizens would automatically always want to maximize their own happiness and minimize their own pain. Antigone, through this refusal to, to, be, to be cowed down by her own pain, become somebody who's able to, in a sense, and I draw from Talal Asad and others here, but I, I don't want to go into details of that. In a sense, she's able to activize her capacity to endure pain, not as a kind of sacrifice, but as a, as a, as a, as a resistance to Creon's logic of management, of efficacy, of this empty promise of happiness. 
that seems to justify all sorts of uh, political uh, sort of um, evil in a sense. And so Antigone's no derives from her capacity in a sense to activize uh, in spite of pain, her ability to say no. And um, in this, I think, in Anvi, we come to a point where we not only recognize the insidious nature of modern statecraft, where the face of the state might, and, and we, one thinks of Gramsci's image of the centaur, right? Where he seeks for the modern state as having a human face, but the body of a beast, right? So, and when the human face of civility, consent manufacturing, civil society fails, the, the, the beast, uh, which is violence, brutality is set in motion. So in a sense, um, we, we get a sense in Anvi of, of the notion, the, the nature of this beast, the fact that it is able to convince a massive number of people that in fact, uh, in Fran France, in Europe, that, that Nazism is for the good of the maximum number, in a sense, right? And, and, and the scapegoating of a certain, certain group of people can maximize the happiness of others. It is not simply violence that allows this to happen. It is a certain kind of conviction of a certain kind of manufacture of consent that allows this to happen. And Antigone stands against this logic of the maximizing of happiness in the state's interest and the state claiming to be, uh, speak for his uh, citizens. Antigone becomes the first person, as a woman, she's not a citizen within the, within the Greek uh, sort of uh, you know, political understanding, but she seems to be transgressing in order to act politically and, and the first person who seems to sort of absolutely refute this logic of uh, uh, statecraft, but also to willfully repudiate her own citizenship, willfully uh, to say that I spit on your notion of happiness, of this notion of happiness that you want to impose on me. I would rather die. So it's easy, and people have done so, to read Antigone's action here in Anvil as, as an act of suicide. But when you read the text carefully, and when you actually begin to see what she actually says, she never denies the fact that she's afraid of death, that she feels pain. But she cannot bring herself to submit to this sort of absolutely, uh, you know, um, and she speaks. She speaks of the of the kind of the the, the double speak and the insidiousness of of crayons. Uh, in a sense, um, the Sophoclean crayon is a far more simple uh, figure of power to understand than than Anvil's. And uh, the complexity of Antigone's resistance, when she's stripped of all sorts of logic to justify her action, and she still insists that this is valuable even if it achieves nothing, even if I have no legacy, even if no one remembers me, even if everyone thinks that I was um, a traitor, this action is still valuable because it flies in the face of your logic of management. It's, it says a clear and resounding no, uh, according to Kya Chapurukya, the way she put it, against this, this uh, you know, uh, two-faced brutality in a certain way. Okay, I should stop. I mean, I was trying to summarize a lot in, in a, you know, and I'm sorry if I've gone on too long and if everyone's bored to death, but yeah, that's it. All right. No, no, not at all. It, you know, none of us are bored to death and I'm taking the liberty to talk on behalf of everyone here. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for, for uh, the talk. Um, I think I actually had a couple of questions regarding Antigone and regarding this, this you know, uh, efficacy of the political will, which also got clarified. But um, without, you know, I have a question, but I'll ask in the end, towards the end, uh, you know, if uh, nobody has uh, more questions. But I know that Josie, uh, my colleague, has a question. So Josie, would you like to uh, go on? Right now, we are opening the floor for questions and answers. So if you want to, you know, put down your questions in the chat box, that's also fine. If you want to uh, unmute yourselves and ask the questions, that's also absolutely fine with us. Yeah. I just want to thank everyone for coming uh, in sort of a, in the morning so early and listening for such a long time. And uh, it's a it's a complicated 
sort of a piece and I don't know how much I think uh, how much I was able to convey but once you ask me questions maybe I can clarify a few things because uh, yeah, might have been a little hurried so <clears throat> so if, would Josie want Josie, to yeah. Yeah, yeah sure yeah so thank you so much professor for that uh, edifying uh, session uh, mm -hmm. just uh, two questions so one is regarding uh, sister Ismene Right. So, how do we uh, understand uh, Ismini? Is she just a fearful subject, or uh, how do you locate her, situate uh, Ismini in the you know feminist readings? Is she just a fearful subject who has uh, kind of you know internalized the uh, existing uh, patriarchal norms, or is there something uh, more to her? And, uh, secondly, so does the uh, Sophocles uh, play? Uh, so, is there any other possibilities apart from, you know, obedience and disobedience, civil disobedience, uh, in a sense, you know, or represented by Antigone? Like, uh, are there any other grounds for uh, politics? So, yeah, these are the yeah. two. Yeah. Um, so, the first uh, question uh, is many in uh, in the uh, Anvil text. You'll find that uh, just before the end, uh, is many is. Uh, is um, does in fact come out in support of uh, Antigone, right? Uh, just before the end, she spends most of the of the you know the the duration of the play trying to convince Antigone not to do this illogical thing, but just before the end, she appears to sort of stand up against Creon when she realizes that Antigone is is just about to die. Um, for Ismini, I I have often found that uh, dramaturgically, both in Sophocles and in Anvil, Ismini is imagined more or less as a foil to Antigone. She does not seem to have, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, one could in fact perform her more complexly, but she does not seem to have a lot of, you know, layers. Uh, in, in a sense, she is a foil in the sense that she actually exemplifies the docility that Antigone you know, refuses constantly. I mean, she is more feminine against whom Antigone is kind of failure to be feminine enough, her failure to, in fact, you know, and this, this in fact, in, in the, the chorus right at the beginning and the chorus in, uh, in Anvil as opposed to Sophocles is a very sardonic, cynical individual. He seems to be a middle-aged man who's kind of cynical about all these, you know, he doesn't seem to have any moral bone in his body at all. So he starts off the whole play by saying that, oh, it's such a surprise that, you know, Heman chose Antigone over Ismene because Ismene is so much prettier. So he's, he's very much the kind of, you know, pretty, you know, quite sexist in fact so he he is very much this so you don't actually even find that kind of um reassuring voice of the chorus in in, in Anvil. I mean, he, Anvil even takes away that that comfort but but the chorus frames is more or less as the kind of feminine foil to Antigone, who's who's the transgressive bad girl in in all senses nobody would ever compare his to a, to an animal or to a mad woman for that matter, right? But it's true that Ismene in Anvil also betrays elements where you find that that there is an there's an element where she should she she seems to hate herself for not being able to speak up more. And by the end of it, there is one moment where she actually stands up to Crayon to say that, see that this is a disease that is catching, even I have got it. So at that point of time, it appears that Antigone, strangely, and that metaphor is, is chilling right now, seems to have an infectious disease. If she's allowed to live longer, more and more people are going to catch this disease of rebellion from her. And so somebody as docile as Ismene seems to have, have got it. Um, and that, that, is a, that is an interesting uh, sort of uh, scene in the, in the play where Ismene seems to have a turnaround right before the end. Um, are there other modes between obedience and disobedience? I think all of us straddle these these uh, modes, uh, you know, as citizens, as uh, employees, as 
you know, members of families. Nobody is consistently obedient or disobedient, which is why I, I really urge you to read the annual text because it appears from what I have said that that uh, Antigone is this kind of strident figure who's kind of constantly shouting rebellion from start to end, but she's not. When you actually read the text, you find that one of her most tender spe speeches is, is for her dog Floss. It's a tiny, tiny dog that 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 she she who, which is her pet, and she's most worried about what's going to happen to this dog when uh, she dies. There's another speech where she says that I I'm going to be buried alive, and she's she's afraid of this being. And it's this is not an execution. She's not going to be executed. She's actually being going to be sort of condemned to a certain kind of a living death. Right, where she's isolated and further sort of, you know, uh, sort of uh, marginalized and, and, and sort of taken outside society. And she says, I wish that even animals have a warm body to cling to when they're sick or dying. And I shall not have that because I will be alone. So there are these moments when she's incredibly vulnerable, claiming protection, claiming, I mean, sort of craving protection, craving safety, craving tenderness. But then she oscillates back in spite of all of this. So which is why it, it, is, it becomes a rebellion that you can, that does not seem the rebellion of a hero. She's not a uh, you know, Greek tragic hero in that sense at all in Anvi. She's somebody who's, who's, who's deeply embedded in these relationships with other bodies, not just human bodies, but even animal bodies. And she craves that comfort. But, but in spite of all of these fears, anxieties, the fear of deep fear of loneliness. She comes back to this point again and again, which Kia says to say no, no, because she finds herself incapable of balancing all of these attachments against capitulation to the logic that Creon represents. Right. So it's not as if Antigone is like this kind of upright figure of rebellion from the beginning to the end without any respite whatsoever, which is what, what makes her far more, far closer to us as, as you know. So because constantly we are os oscillating between, she's afraid, she's lonely, she's scared, she's, she's sad, she wants to marry Heman. She even actually goes to Heman in order to have sex because she thinks that she will not have sexual experience if she dies. She, she pretty much goes to Heman and says that, can we, can we, you know, can I just at least have some sexual experience before I, that, I mean, so, so things like that. I mean, there are things that she does which are, which are, which are, which, which constantly show us her anxiety about what she's doing. But it is in spite of this that she seems to discipline herself into a kind of uh, resistance. So, in a sense, if there is another law that Antigone is holding up against Creon's law, it is not religion. It is not kinship. It is the discipline of resistance. Resistance is also a discipline. You're constantly pulled back, but you come back to it. You come back again and again and again and again. Not because you have no vulnerability, but because in spite of the vulnerability, you discipline yourself into a kind of resistance. Right? Okay. All right. And then. Okay. Uh, over to you, Jigisha. Yeah. Uh, all right. Are there questions people want to ask from the audience? I have gotten one in the chat box, so I'll just read it out. Um, so this is from Hanima Grewal. Um, she, uh, they are asking that, can we say that the logical justification of Creon is a pretense and a facade to hide his ultimate desire to claim power over the polity? I, I want to repeat that thing I said very quickly at the end. And this comes, uh, this is an image that actually draws from Machiavelli's prints, but something that Gramsci goes back to which is how do we understand the modern state? And this metaphor is that of a centaur. If you know what a centaur is, Harry Potter had centaurs. So centaur, <laughs> centaurs are, uh, you know, monsters with a, with a human torso and a human face, but the body of a beast. So, so in many, sense when, when, many senses, when Gramsci is speaking of hegemony of civil society of uh, you know he is trying to actually define for us how in fact this this manufacturing of of consent a certain kind of hegemony of the ruling class allows a kind of perception of civility to continue it is when these these many modes of manufacturing 
uh, through civil society uh, organs of the state uh, consent fall apart that in fact the the nether regions of the state emerge and the nether regions are really brutish they're violent and the state is always capable of dismantling civility in order to mobilize um, its brutish aspects. The truth is simultaneously, because we live in many different kinds of political realities and simultaneities uh, in a subcontinent like India, it is true that the state may be the, you know, entirely civil in its facade uh, in the metropolitan uh, sort of sites while being absolutely brutish on the margins, right? So that the face of the state that you may see in Kashmir is not the face of the state that you that that you may see in Delhi, but the problem is when the hegemony begins to crack because it is an unstable and unjust, uh, you know, uh, hegemony. What is bound to emerge is the brutish face. So it is not a facade. It is in fact a beast. The civility is also part of this. This it's it's a beast that is joined at the hip. The human face is always um, sort of. Uh, the foundation of it is always, in a sense, violent. So, um, but just to remember that in Gramsci, there is also, there is bad hegemony and good hegemony. So not all hegemony. So he, he when he talks about the expansive hegemony of the working class, he's speaking about democratic alliances between forces that may have been, that, that are in fact, uh, that have been marginal and oppressed. So, so but the, this kind of a fractured hegemony always, uh, has violence threatening to emerge from the cracks at all times. So let us not see Creon as an individual with a, who is a hypocritical individual, but, but to understand that the, the, the structure of the state, in fact, that's the point about Creon. I mean, he, 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 he is in fact a cog in the wheel of a system that is uh, in fact brutish, but pretends to be maximizing the happiness of its citizens. So, yeah. All end. right. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, please write down in the chat box. Meanwhile, I'll ask a question that I had, which is that um, <clears throat> the in the Sophocles text, for example, we see um, the general idea of you know the 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 um, Creon, Constantine, Creon, and others constantly terming Antigone as man or manly and you know the all the male characters in contrast to Antigone they are actually sort of termed as you know she is more man than the men etc etc now uh, in Anvil when we come we see that you know this this concept of um, her being termed as a man or her being termed as manly has changed right so there's a new sort of uh, terminology that's emerging as mad women, uh, mad woman as a whore, as a beast, right? So I just wanted to ask this is, I mean, in relation to the text also that how does the symbolism of this, you know, female protagonist, how does it change from, you know, being called manly and then being called either beastly or, you know, a prostitute or, you know, several other things. So um, like how does it change vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, how the state continues to see women's political action? So how is this uh, sort of trajectory happening? The change in the symbolism of Antigone's figure. Yeah, you know what? I mean, unfortunately, um, this, uh, this division between public and private and the gendered nature of that division goes across the board. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost everywhere, right? Mm. I mean, if you're talking about the Nazi state, we know that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, even uh, sort of the, 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 um, the German women of the best kind of, you know, genetic descent were also mostly seen as, you know, makers of, you know, uh, sort of racially pure, citizens right um to so the, so one was not uh, really stepping outside one hadn't stepped outside that kind of uh, understanding quite a lot but if you actually i want to go back to butler a little bit and, and talk about this that this is to do more 
this has to do uh, with a lot more than just women's capacity or uh, you know um, sort of whether women are allowed to sort of act politically or not. Um, Butler, uh, I've often talked about this essay, so you must have heard me talk about this many times. The, uh, this uh, essay that Butler writes after the Arab Spring. Uh, called Bodies in Alliance and Politics of the Street, which then gets um, becomes a chapter in her book, um, Notes Towards a, a, a Sort of, a, what was the book called? The, uh, Assem Notes Towards, uh, so, so it was about, you know, so that this particular book is about performance in assembly and uh, in a sense a performance of protest and what corporeality has to do with it. Um, so uh, notes to the performative theory of assembly, I think that's that's what the book was called, the 2014 or something uh, that it came out. So what she says in this essay is very interesting. She says that the Occupy movements and also what happens in, in the Arab Spring, uh, not the what, what, what these movements lead to, but what actually happens physically in these movements destabilizes the traditional Western uh, understanding, both in commonsensical terms and in political philosophy, that separates the public from the private. And this understanding, she says, is also in you know uh, present in political philosophers we admire a lot, like Hannah Arendt. Right, the notion that political action is something that is to be performed in the public sphere, it it consists in rational speech and thought. Uh, it consists in a certain kind of public debate and is abstracted from the body. The space of the body is mostly the, the oikia, where in fact the domestic sphere, where all kinds of corporeal actions take place, you eat, sleep, you kind of, you defecate, you copulate, whatever. So that's the space where all of these things, which are, which are in fact at the level of what we have called the animality of man. Now all of that goes on in the in the in the in the domestic sphere, and the public sphere is a space where the the, the political uh, uh, sort of will of man, abstracted from the body, is in fact in in operation, right? So Butler says, interestingly, these movements destabilize that division. It makes corporeality political. People are doing things in the public space that they're meant to do at home. So the public sphere then becomes a space where people sleep, where people eat, where they live, where they where they make love, uh, where they do all the things that they're meant to do in private. So this is this is not simply to do with women's political action, but it is to do with the destabilizing of the gendering of the public and private in political understanding. So even when we're not talking about women and women's political action, there is something determining our understanding of political action that says certain kinds of action are political. Going back to Ronsier, what is the political question that cannot be asked? That is the most political question. So the notion that corporeality is not political. The world of the body belongs to a sphere separate from politics. So in a sense, these movements bring, so think of Shaheen Bagh as well. You know, or you know what we have seen in our country, uh, you know, in 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 recent times. So in even the farmers' protests recently, lot was said about how you know nurtured care, food, cooking, how people were taking care of each other, how you know a certain kind of life was being lived out in the open, where there was no separation of the abstracted intellect, the political will, rationality from the corporeal actions of the body, which are seemed to be, which, are, which were meant to be invisible. So that gendering is broken down in these spaces. Um, so I don't think the modern state has quite, you know, the liberal state, even the modern liberal state has reformulated its understanding to the extent that yes, you can now bring, bring babies into the parliament and that's seen as very you know radical but the liberal state is is liberal because it manages to survive by these little kind of elbow room that it gives but fundamentally i don't think it has but there's a fundamental reconfiguration that butler claims has happened in these kinds of movements against the state by bringing this out into public in a way so that uh, yeah that's the answer all right uh we have a question but we are like just running out of time. So I guess we will have to end it here. Uh, we have a question about, you know, um, 
Antigone being reimagined as a queer protagonist in 2021. I'll make sure, and this is from Ajay M. I'll make sure that I get it to the speaker and then, you know, we get back to you with the answer. Yeah, I mean, you can you can mail uh, Jigisha and she can forward it to me. And I'm yeah, yeah. happy if to. You, if any of you have, you know, more questions, please feel free to uh, forward it to me. And um, yeah, I guess thank you so much, uh, Trinadi. I just this. hope I didn't bore bore Super. you. I mean, it was too long. I mean, I just superb uh, lecture and thanks everyone else um, for joining. Um, I guess uh, Josie, do you want to add anything to it? Will there be a recording of this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'll circulate the recording. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming for our you know first guest lecture this year. And thank you so much, Professor. It was, as I said earlier, a truly edifying session. Okay. I look forward to like reading more about Antigone and I mean, I'll be writing to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. I guess uh, we are going to sign off now. And uh, thank you again, Srinathi. Yeah.